not just the fear that science will undermine their belief system, but the, the, but the fact that scientists are claiming that, they're, that, that, that basically people are stupid and that we can tell you what to believe. And, I've, and I happen to think that that is not, it actually demeans science as well as demeaning religion. That, in fact, science does not encompass the entirety of human intellectual experience, and, and, and we can't pretend it does. And there are things of vital importance to people that have nothing to do with rationality. And they're profoundly important in a large part of people's lives. And to ignore that is to, not is to demean those people, but as I say, to demean science. And people have said, and in fact, I think maybe the cardinal may have even talked about scientism. It's a recent word. But I think it's, it's probably worth approaching. That when scientists, and I can say, for me, there's no evidence whatsoever of design or purpose in the universe based on my study of cosmology. That's a fine scientific statement for me to say. But for then for me to say, therefore, there was no design or purpose, that's a metaphysical statement or a philosophical statement that I'm entitled to make, but I'm not being a scientist when I'm making it. And I think we have to recognize that, 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 that it's beyond the limits of science to, to go that far. And in fact, um, uh, as I just say there, and in fact, to, 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 to quote Annie Drunen's here, to quote Carl Sagan, um, uh, the absence of evidence is not evidence for absence. And, and, and he applied it in that case to aliens, I suppose, or something. But, but uh, uh, it, it's true. The, the fact that there's no evidence for design or purpose in the universe is not the same as saying there's no design or purpose. It's, I think the, the latter statement is a philosophical statement. And actually, Richard Dawkins begins his new book with a quote from Thomas Jefferson, which I lo like a lot. He said, I'm satisfied and sufficiently occupied with the things which are, without tormenting or troubling myself about those which may indeed be, but which I have no evidence. Steve put it another way, which I think is equally true. Most scientists don't think enough about God to even call themselves atheists. It's not a question that arises. Why should we trouble ourselves with that? We should trouble ourselves, in fact, with doing science. And, uh, and here's a statement from the International Theological Commission, a statement actually at the time when, when uh, uh, Pope Benedict was then a cardinal and head of that commission. And, and as, as he stated at the time, as they stated in the sign, there's no, they had no problem with evolution because God is the cause of all causes. As a result, through the activity of natural causes, God causes to arise those conditions required for the emergence and support of living organisms, and furthermore, for the reproduction and differentiation. A statement where the Theological Commission actually said, as they called um, uh, contingent phenomena, purely random phenomena, are perfectly in accord with Catholic theology. There's no way that I can see that science can disprove that, that kind of statement, and it's a waste of time, it seems to me, to try. Uh, and totally non-productive. What we should focus on, it seems to me, is the fact that the universe is a remarkable place without all the junk. That only when we're willing to accept the universe for what it is, without fear, will we be able to build a just society. This we'll get on to later tomorrow. Science, we should focus on the fact that science isn't a threat to a moral world. That science has an ethos. And the ethos of science is actually pretty good. It's based on honesty, open-mindedness, creativity, egalitarianism, I would put it at anti-authoritarianism, and full disclosure. If any of these things were common, say, in Washington right now, the world would be a better place. <laughs> and the fundamental thing about science is that it works. And that's what's really important to stress, is that it leads to, a, in many ways, a better world. It works. It allows us to describe and, in some sense, control the world. And we should recognize that and use that fact. When President Bush said both sides should be taught, when it comes to intelligent design and evolution. Well, that wasn't an intrinsically stupid statement, surprisingly. It was, it was I I if there were two sides, it's a perfectly appropriate statement. It represented ignorance. There, there, there aren't two sides to that scientific argument. But, at the same, but it's amazing, when the avian flu was developed, President Bush immediately said, well, we have to immediately start working on how long it's going to take to mi mutate and migrate to humans. You didn't see anyone saying, well, it's been designed to kill us. Said, Forget it, you know. Uh, uh, Immediately, when there's a problem, people turn to science. And that's what we should be focusing on, the fact that what science can do. And when people talk about family values, we should focus on the fact that the real family values are, are owing our children the best science preparation, the best education we can give them, so they can compete in the 21st century that's going to depend for, on our future for, for, on, on science and, and technology. And uh, finally, I think, I'll just leave it. We should, we should focus on the fact that mysteries, that not knowing is actually a good thing, that not knowing is wonderful that you don't have to know everything. And, and the mysteries that science explores are, are, are probably the best. And so I'll leave it with the other hero, Stephen, uh, uh, um, Albert Einstein, to, uh, to, who, who said, the fairest thing we can experience is the mysterious. It's the fundamental emotion that stands at the cradle of true art and true science. 
and it's the mysterious, I think, and our, and our, and our fascination with the world, which scientists can use to, instead of attack religion, I think encourage people of faith to understand the world that actually is rather than the world that they would like it to be. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. I don't know if there's anything, Steve, is there anything you want to respond to briefly there? I, I do remember yesterday you mentioned um, that you r kept running into people who somehow were able to hold these opposing things in their mind. There was an oil man in Texas who... Yeah, so uh, yeah, this is a, a second-hand story that a friend of mine met an oil man in Texas who... Uh, believed that the earth was uh, 6,000 years old because that's what's taught in the book of Genesis and also believed that the uh, deposits of oil in the Permian Basin were 50 million years old because that's what you need to know in order to explore for petroleum and somehow or other he managed this uh, a, a feat of intellectual acrobatics that I can only admire. Uh, um, well, I'm of course I should say, with, uh, since Larry mentioned that the question of teaching evolution in the schools will come to Texas, of course it already has, and I testified in front of a, uh, uh, the Texas school board who has the responsibility of choosing uh, textbooks for the whole state, and uh, they, some of them were in favor of bringing intelligent design into the textbooks and others were opposed to it. Uh, but I found, interestingly, that the ones who were in favor of, it, of bringing intelligent design into the textbooks were very anxious to divorce it from any idea of religion. They said, we just want good science. And they, uh, there was, that fits in with my remark that there really isn't hostility to science itself in the West, uh, whereas I think it, there is in, in the Islamic world. Um, actually, we won that argument, and uh, evolution without intelligent design as an alternative is what you find in textbooks used in Texas schools. Um, I certainly don't argue that uh, science can disprove the existence of God, and I also wouldn't argue that science can disprove the existence of um, fairies at the bottom of the garden. Um, it's just after a while, experiencing the world and not seeing any sign of it, you begin to take those ideas less seriously. Uh, one thing I would say to what you said, Steve, is that the very people who were talking to you, and, they, and as I unfortunately spent a lot of time with those people uh, who have been pushing intelligent design in the schools, when they say they want to teach just, just want to teach good science, their definition of good science is very different than yours. And, uh, and, that's, and so I, I think the, the, the supposition that they're not hostile to science is, is probably naive, I think. I think that they're hostile to the kind of science that you would like to do and that I would like to do. Well, let, let's at least say that they don't want to march under the banner of yeah. anti-science. That, that I think is true, absolutely. And, and they couch it. And, but the interesting thing is the very people who couch it as good science there, if you read the internal literature, present those diagrams. Mm. And, and so... Uh, so there is that, there is that, they're, they're very effective in public relations because most of the public respects science still, although there's been a decline in that if you look at the polls. Uh, but so I think they're, uh, they're savvy enough to realize that they have to couch their discussion as if they're interested in good science in order to appeal to the voters. Could I just add another, uh, another voice to the conversation at this point? Um, you, you mentioned Richard's book and a couple, you were a couple of quotes there in your, your nature review. Um, Richard will be here a little bit later on, um, but in the interim, perhaps we could add Sam Harris's voice to the conversation.